Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so excited today to be joined by the fantastic Janish Meeting, currently starring in Peacock series, Rutherford Falls. And I wanted to talk about your work as a writer first, because you were originally coming into this project as part of the writer's room and had been working on writing extensively on your own projects for a really, really long time and trying to get your foot in the door. Um, and I loved even the fact that you were diving into books like, you know, Save the Cat and really self-teaching yourself. And so when you finally got staff on a show like this as a writer, what were some of the things that you realized you just like intrinsically understood and in terms of like structure and story and character that really came into play and were beneficial that you had that experience with yourself already? So much of my experience doing live comedy helped uh, me sort of uh, perform in the writer's room. So, you know, all of the independent um, sketch comedy and improv comedy and even, you know, the solo comedy experiences that I had sort of explored and put myself through in New York um, were extremely helpful in being able to understand how to function in a writer's room. It didn't feel like a, a foreign environment to me. Um, and uh, I, I really did feel well equipped knowing how to pitch jokes and, you know, be like in a, in a joke room. Um, I think the bigger learning processes for me that happened sort of on the job as a staff writer, we're learning how to structure story within an episode. And I was fortunate enough to be working alongside um, really talented writers who also were willing to um, sort of teach and educate uh, these younger writers, myself included, um, and newer writers um, and coach us into understanding how to uh, format an episode and how to format a season. And, and um, so, you know, Sierra was really like uh, elemental in, in establishing the culture of our writer's room and making it um, really inclusive to new ideas and new experiences and encouraged us, especially the native writers on the show, you know, she would encourage us to like, Hey, you need to talk more. You need to share your stories more in the room. Like I need your voice. Um, so it was really helpful to have such a warm, welcoming and thoughtful, uh, leadership from Sierra and Ed and Mike Shore. Yeah, no, it sounds like an incredible experience from the way everyone talks about the writer's room. And then Sierra was the one who originally gave you the sides for auditioning for Regan. And when it came to the audition, what was that journey of figuring out how you were going to play her? Because you'd been so innately involved in the construction of who she was as a character already. So I imagine that it was both terrifying because you're in the room with people that you've been working with, but at the same time beneficial because you know so many layers beyond the details in the script that you're performing in that moment. You know, the character of Regan was such an amalgamation of the different Native writers' experiences and voices. Um, and I think specifically, you know, Sierra and Tazba and I, the three Native women writers, um, you know, sort of helped to craft uh, Regan's uh, nervousness and her confidence and her her blind spots. Um, those characteristics were really really shaped by um, our our own experiences in community with other Native people and and with white people. Um, and I really just kind of made the decision to bring my own to bring myself to the audition and to to show up and to uh, really like live her jokes and, and, and live her lines and um, working with Ed also, uh, you know, uh, test, screen testing with Ed was so fun because Ed is also a person who is uh, a very generous scene partner. He made me feel uh, present in working with him and he's really engaging in his scene work. And so um, I felt when I was performing with him in those tests that I was, I was really shining. Um, but I made a concerted effort, you know, uh, going into those screen tests is very nerve wracking experience. And is the, the only the second time that I've ever tested for something. Um, and I just didn't know that it was going to be a room full of, you know, 
Peacock execs and NBC execs, you know, and, and my own producers, you know, the people that I had been working alongside. Um, um, and all of those years of live performing really came in handy. The first, uh, the first day, the first screen test I went to, I walked in the room and I, I, I saw the little, you know, I, I look at everybody. I'm like, okay, I have an audience here. It's like, a, it's just like a live performance. And, you know, stepping onto the little soundstage with Ed, um, I started, I looked at Ed and I said, you know, I was listening to Dolly Parton on the way over here to like pump myself up. And he was like, what's the song? And I was like, Islands in the Stream. And uh, as we were like kind of getting mic'd, I started seeing like, Islands in the Stream. That, And then I like looked out into the like audience of execs and I was like, everybody now. <laughs> and everybody was kind of started singing Islands in the Stream. It's just a very like live uh, performance experience to me. Um, so that kind of stuff I'm super comfortable with. I, I'm like fortunate enough to have many years under my belt of performing live. Um, and, and I, I, and I've learned how to sort of like shake the nerves off by engaging with an audience. I also love how you've said that your years of teaching that your students were your toughest audience as well. And I think it's actually, you know, a really great point as well, because there's so many things that we do in life that are not the direct path that we want to be on, but then you find that they come into play. So did you actually very genuinely find that there were a lot of skill sets beyond that from teaching that came into play as a performer? Oh yes. So many, um, you know, teaching, you have to really go into the classroom with confidence. Um, you have to, um, if, if you don't feel like you are sort of in control of the content and the environment, you gotta fake it till you make it, <laughs> you know, you want your students to feel like they are safe and you want them to feel engaged in their learning. And so that's a performance. Those are all performance techniques. And, um, I really brought a lot of that, to not only my performance work, uh, you know, independently, but also to um, this work, not only in the writer's room, but uh, on screen, being able to just like really uh, find ways to engage an audience or to engage a scene partner. It's, uh, it's a teaching tool. Yeah. And then once you started shooting the show, you had uh, Lawrence Sher, who was the director of the first two episodes. And he's also been a DP on things like the Hangover series of movies. So he's someone who comes in with like a really strong comedic sensibility as well, but also understands that comedy is through, you know, telling stories about characters. And so how was working with him on those episodes and having him not just on the pilot, but coming into episode two as well, really pivotal in finding the voice of Regan and the voice of the show once you were all on set? It was pivotal. Uh, Larry, be, having Larry on set, not only was he extremely supportive, especially, you know, those those first few weeks when I was coming, um, this is sort of my first experience being on set and, you know, coming to work every day and doing the thing I love, but just, uh, you know, Larry would greet me in, in the morning and say, I just want to tell you, you're doing a really good job. You're playing to camera in exactly the way that I, you know, he was very collaborative and he wanted to stretch me. Um, and that was really exciting to have um, someone of his caliber um, feeling like a collaborative partner. And that's how I felt from everyone in this experience, from Ed, from Sierra, from, you know, Larry, from Mike is, is just this true feeling of, I want to help you grow and I want to see you shine. And Larry used to do this. He was really fun at, he's, you know, like you said, he's an amazing storyteller um, with uh, his, with his, uh, with the camera, he's just an incredible storyteller. And he would do these things. I, I started calling it face acting <laughs> where he would be like, okay, you're going to sit at the cafeteria table. I'm going to pull, do a, a, a slow pull away. And in that time, I want you to have these feelings 
I want you to experience these feelings in your mind. And I'm going to show you, like, he would like, we would do it like 10 different times and different expressions, facial expressions. Um, and I could tell that he was enjoying playing with my facial expressions. And I was enjoying being stretched in that way and being challenged in that way. So it was really like a true uh, symbiosis. And I, and I understood like, oh, this is how it feels to work with a, a director who really cares about the content. Um, it was awesome. And you were touching before on some of Regan's characteristic traits. And one of the things is that whenever she decides to do anything or make any sort of decision, she dives so far head first and then kind of reels herself back and thinks about it after. Uh, and so I think that must be a really interesting way to structure a character where every choice you make has to be an incredibly bold choice. And then you think about the more nuanced moments after. So how were you structuring a lot of that flow into a lot of her motivations and a lot of her actions? It was really helpful to have uh, Sierra on set. You know, we sh our production happened during um, COVID-19. So our entire experience, I was having a very unique uh, production experience in that um, none of the episodic writers were able to come on set. Um, it was, a, you know, a, a smaller crew and um, a more intimate setting. And But Sierra was there um, every day. And... Uh, uh, and specifically for for scenes that I was in she was she made sure to be there and she really helped me connect the dots to what was before this what is happening after this because we also did a you know our our block shooting made it so that sometimes I was I was doing you know three different episodes in one day and um and and so I started to sort of lose track of Regan in a way her sort of trajectory at certain points in the production. And I just had to play her uh, moment to moment. I really had to just focus on what was the scene, what is happening now. And Sierra would help me to identify like, here's sort of the touchstone of what uh, we're trying to convey with her. And um, and yeah, that was also like the, the, the really exciting fun part about playing Regan is, is her ambition and the way that she just like goes really hard. It's a, it's a level of confidence that I do not have in my actual life. So it feels like a real performance <laughs> when I was doing it <laughs> for better or worse. Um, but she, and then she also has sort of that, uh, that, um, stumbly, sweaty, um, uh, backpedaling uh, characteristic that is truly like just comedy, that's just comedy skills coming into play. And I think a lot of women share those characteristics. Um, so it's really like, uh, that's just pulling straight, straight from the heart, straight from the soul. <laughs> I, I, I love all the sweaty comedy in it. And I, and I love the honesty of that as well. Like one of the scenes that really sticks out is when, you know, she kind of fumbles and then she actually just goes, that was a very accurate, you know, impression. Yeah. It's not, this doesn't happen. That was a one-off. Um, and so how did you want to construct that side of her, the sweaty side ultimately in a way that she's never covering up and she's never apologizing for it. And she's just acknowledging, you know, this is who I am. Um, I think that that's sort of like, um, you know, when I was studying theater in college, I had a professor uh, who was teaching us uh, sort of like clown and how to uh, this kind of buffoonery. And he used this term, taking the drop, which is just the acceptance of failure <laughs> and how that reads on the face and body. <laughs> and it's like truly like a, a very like uh, elemental uh core comedy like historically it is a, is a comedy practice this this art of taking the drop and I feel like in my own life I'm often taking the drop um and just embracing embracing those sweet sweet um moments of of failure and truly blowing it and I think uh so so those moments again for better or worse were um part of Regan that I, I just like, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> 
one of the other aspects of the show that I wanted to ask you about was the the mention of how you all in the writer's room and, and on set and the way that you structured a lot of the character stories leaned into the backfire effect a lot. And that idea that when someone challenges your belief system, you know, it makes you dig in your heels. It doesn't actually necessarily make you change your mind instantly. And the show is a really great example of that. And so how did thinking about the backfire effect so consciously for all of you in writing and then on set? that really play into the structure of a lot of the stories that we get to see. I think in many ways, every each one of the characters experiences a bit of the, the backfire effect, you know, um, uh, Nathan very obviously is sort of like digging his heels into his own history. And that is a really fun dynamic to play um, between him and Regan, who is sort of ends up challenging his history and being the person who confronts it. And um, I think Regan does it in her own community. She sort of like is like um, uh, very flippant about like her community involvement and being the the you know the the face of the cultural center in the beginning and it's it takes somebody like Terry to be like excuse you who who do you think you are nobody likes you here <laughs> um, but we also see her grow um, in a in a different direction I think it's important uh, it was important for us as storytellers to say um, that. Yes, a lot of us experience this uh, uh, backfire effect in our own lives and our own philosophies, um, but it, it, we don't have to. And, and some people don't, and we can learn and grow as adults. We can, our ideas can be changed and they can evolve. And so I think that Regan is sort of uh, that, that, uh, that middle man between, uh, you know, these two, uh, male uh energies in in the world that are sort of like doubling down on their on their belief systems and we are going to see we saw it with nathan in the first season if we get a second season knock on wood we will see it happen to terry you know it, it's like perfect we've set it up perfectly that everybody has an opportunity to eventually face the music of what they're really uh setting up for themselves there you go. We need a season two for more Terry. We sure do. <laughs> and when you look at the show overall, you know, one of the things that people have really responded to are a lot of the political and social commentary in the show. But when you actually step back and look at the writing and the characters, it is about the dynamic of these characters, their relationships, their emotional journeys. It's not really about whether this statue gets moved at all or not. Um, and so was that something that you were all very consciously thinking of in terms of the way that you structured out a lot? of these stories and the way that you wanted to approach it throughout the show. That was a really interesting learning process for me as a writer on this show uh, was understanding the way that especially Mike uh, Shure in his shows, he's really telling the story of individuals, of characters and um, living within a larger social construct, right? And, and um, instead of playing the social construct we're actually playing the reactions of the characters within this you know situation and um and i think that when we take that angle um to really hone in and and create uh, strong characteristics and identities for the characters in the show um not only do you have so much room for this character to move in and out of the world and to, you know, there's so many different storylines that can evolve from each for each character. Um, uh, but we also see sort of this uh, richness of world and character that directly combats stereotypes. And as native writers, this is something that we were very conscious of. How do we make sure that we're not, that our only source of comedy is it isn't just making fun of native stereotypes and tropes, you know? Well, the response to that is give them a heart and soul, give them a family, give them an internal life. Um, and, and um, then you're, then you're really combating stereotypes and tropes because they're individuals. 
And I love your scenes in the show with Michael Gray eyes. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about working with him on this, this series because um, you've, you've talked in the past about how he's someone who very much intellectualizes everything and is always very open to having conversations, not even just before you shoot a scene, but also even once you film something, talking about the work that you've just done together. And so I was interested in those conversations that you have after a scene and how that is actually a really beneficial tool once you're looking forward to the next scenes that you're going to be doing together. It was wonderful to build that rapport with Michael off screen, sort of this, um, to have someone there who was um, helping me to process this experience because um, really it was a very um, surreal almost experience to play a native person uh, existing in contemporary times, to play a me, you know? I didn't realize how much I have internalized from, um, you know, native erasure in film and television. I, I've spent my entire adulthood combating it and childhood combating erasure. Um, and it, I didn't really realize until I was doing the thing with Michael, another native person, uh, how much I had internalized that. And so it was really helpful to have someone who had so much experience in this industry um, and, and performing to, you know, leave the leave set and be like, that was so much fun. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're doing this. I can't believe Terry has an SUV. I, I you know, Terry has like a, a wife and a, and two kids and they're standing, you know, as just these like these um, sort of epiphanies but also the ability to talk about our craft and to and to to talk about acting, <laughs> which is something that Michael has spoken a lot about. You know, a lot of times when um, uh, marginalized people get these opportunities um, in mainstream uh, film and TV, um, a lot of the questions that they get asked about their process shooting the show or or being a part of a production is about their identity and not necessarily about their craft. And it was a really great opportunity to sit with another native person and to talk about, oh, when here's how I deliver a joke or here's what I was taught in comedy. You know, it was a lot of like trading secrets. Um, and that was such a beautiful, wonderful collaboration I felt. And I felt it with Ed as well. Yeah. You know, and speaking of, of Ed as well, it really, you know, always sounds like he's a performer who is willing to play in the moment and, you know, is always very truthful to the text, but will always kind of take that time and that moment to play around and see what else is there. And are there any particular moments that you look back on now from shooting this, where you realize that there were certain instances that you really found in Regan or a particular scene because of that opportunity to work in that way with him? Oh yeah. Um, you know, especially in the beginning, my first, um, my, my first few weeks were specifically with Ed, um, and doing just, you know, two person scenes with Ed. And so it was really helpful in creating, uh, the, the relationship between Nathan and Regan, it, it helped to contextualize Regan and to give her sort of, um, you know, to, to keep her grounded in this world. And for me as a performer working with Ed, it was an amazing opportunity to have, again, someone with uh, Ed's experience um, to, to really sort of welcome me in and, and, uh, and like shroud me with support and to encourage me. He was very encouraging. If you want to try this bit, uh, you know, in this scene, um, you can either tell me or you don't have to tell me, I'll just roll with it. And he said, you know, sometimes I'm going to sort of uh, improvise um, and try this line. Uh, so just like go with it. Um, so it was really like a, uh, this open communication about like, how we can build this deep friendship, this lifelong friendship together. And a, a lot of it relied on um, uh, his encouragement to improvise and his ability to improvise. He's such a good actor and improviser. Um, and I would just be in a scene with him or watching him um, and not when I was not in scenes with him and I was just learning just watching and learning the way that he interacts with the crew and, and, and the way that he delivers his lines and in scenes and, and improvises. Um, 
it made the process so joyful and fun. And it felt like a real comedy, you know, just doing comedy with Ed Helms, which was mind blowing. Um, but you can see it in his work. You can see that joy and that presence and that, uh, that like fun playfulness in his work. And so I was like, that's how that translates. Got it. And with Regan overall, she's very much a character who knows every single person in that town and has some sort of relationship or rapport with every single character, even if it's someone that she just walked past on the street. It's someone that she knows and she has a history with. And so what are the ways in which that allowed you a lot more subtext to the smaller moments and the smaller interactions in the show? Those were some of the m most fun scenes uh, to do, uh, you know, I think um, that was such a, a a gift that the writing team gave to Regan, which is this just true ability to interact with every single character on the show and to have a, a, a rapport with each person on the show. Um, and as a performer, it gave me a, an opportunity to learn from and, and work with, you know, people like Paul F. Tompkins and Beth Stelling and Geraldine Keems, you know, people that are in my mind, comedy icons and, you know, uh, like Hollywood icons. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was uh, that a lot of that stuff came through the writing which was just to set up Regan as sort of this middleman in this world. And she's being pulled in a lot of different directions. It, it, it builds the world, it gives the world meaning and it, and it creates again, a, a feeling of a community to have sort of the Regan lens on Rutherford Falls. Um, and it also, uh, it, it has, there's a lot of opportunity for comedy in that push pull, that tension uh, is where Regan sort of lives. And so that's what creates a, a, a sweaty, confident, but blind, but, but blinded sort of like ignorant Regan. Um, and, and that world, uh, that character was so much fun to play with. And when you look at all your work in both writing and performing on the show, um, what are some of the aspects that you're proudest of having accomplished in your work on Rutherford Falls? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the collaboration that Rutherford Falls was. Um, I felt very much like I was part of a team. Um, you know, I, I'm so proud of our writing. Uh, truly the experience of developing this show with the, the group of writers that I got to work with was exceptional. It was such a huge um, opportunity for me to learn and grow uh, as a storyteller. I didn't know how much touch the writing team would have on production. Um, so we were able to, you know, have discussions with the um, production designers on the show and the costume department and, you know, uh, you know, the music. Uh, we pulled in Native people from our community, from our own community, people that we're friends with and that we purchased from and, and we helped to build this world, you know, not only on the page, but in the production. And so I'm really proud of that because I think that um, so many viewers, specifically Indigenous viewers, are watching the show and be like, I have that sweatshirt or I have those earrings or, um, oh, this is... Um, hallucination like this is I know these I know these musicians you know so it brings the audience in to the viewing experience more intimately and it makes them a part of the world of Rutherford Falls which is so um so exciting to me and so fulfilling and it really makes me proud to have been a part of this production it is such a great series. And as I was saying to you before, before we taped this, I think everyone I know has given their credit card information to Peacock based on this series <laughs> if they hadn't already. So congratulations on everything with the show and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mara.